I forbid you maidens all that wear gold in your hair to travel to Carter Hall, for young Tamlin is there. None that go by Carter Hall, but they leave him a pledge, either their mantles of green or else their maiden head. Janet tied her kirtle green a bit above her knee, and she's gone to Carter Hall as fast as go can she. She'd not pulled a double rose, a rose but only two, when up came young Tamlin, says Lady Pull no more. Okay, so we just heard the song of Tam Lin, half fairy, half human. And for this evening, we're going to delve into this world of fairy and story and song. And who are these fairy folk that are so ubiquitous in folklore all over the world with their strange names like Boggart, Bogle, and Redcap, and Willa the Wyke and Selkie and Kelpie and Durgar and Bruni and Brownie and Brown Man with names that echo the, the kind of places where they live, you know, the, the desolate places, the moors and the fenlands and the marshes, little lights hanging in the darkness, luring human beings. You even find them in barns, in human dwellings. They're actually there everywhere where the human imagination goes, the fairy folk. Yeah, but who are they? Where do they come from? Before Christianity, there were huge rituals making peace with the fairy folk, making sure they were on your side. Some people think the fairy folk were or are indeed diminished gods. In Ireland, there was a whole race of gods called the Tuatha de Danann, who were defeated in battle. And they think that perhaps the fairy folk shrunk in size and went and hid under the rocks. And there they dwell today, known as the She. Perhaps they are memories of our hunter-gatherer, Mesolithic forebears, memories of before we had farming and the kind of civilization we have today, perhaps they're memories of that. Others think fairy folk are the voice of the earth speaking. Could be that. Whatever they are, they're there in our conscious and unconscious living in that kind of liminal world between the upper ground and the underground, the sky and the earth, conscious, unconscious, they're always there, the fairies. In Northumberland, a particular sort of heart place of the fairy is Simonside Hills. The famous Durgar lives on the Simonside Hills and there's fairy folk living in many different places, particularly associated with ancient sites, Iron Age forts and Bronze Age tumuli. They are there. At Brinkburn Priory, there's supposed to be a graveyard of the fairies. I went there one day, I, I got lost and was eventually directed by a rather puzzled housewife who said I should just ask her, husband the farmer and he'll show me where the fairy graveyard is and I did get there and it was a sort of a raised bit of land above the priory you could see the Simonside hill from there and I did wonder what is a fairy graveyard do fairies die now I'm not sure about that, that would make them mortal but more likely it's a graveyard in terms of the idea of the fairy Christianity got rid of the fairies. Or perhaps 
maybe not entirely. Not far from Simon's side in the town of Elston, if any of you have been there, it's a, a funny place. It's got a huge market square in the middle where the um, drovers used to come with their cattle. And that place is thick with story. Maybe that's as a result of the droving people coming with their songs and their stories many, many years ago. But there's one story of a couple of young lads who came out from Newcastle on the train one day to, for a bit of sport. And they went up in the hills with their guns and their bags and their bait. And they shot whatever they could see, you know, rabbits, hares, pigeons, grouse. And having a break at lunchtime, they sat on a little sunny spot. And one of the lads decided he wanted to have a drink, so he walked down to the stream and he crouched down as you did and he held out his hands and he was busy drinking that beautiful clear stream water when he heard this voice. And the voice says, what do you think you're doing? Killing my creatures when I only eat the berries. And the young man slowly raised his head and he saw this wild little fellow with red hair and staring eyes and of course his heart nearly stopped and he said I, I, I will not kill another thing I promise and the little wild man seemed to soften and then he beckoned to the young man to cross the stream he was about to leap when his friend shouted and he turned around. And when he looked back, the little fellow was gone. When he told his mate, his mate said, just as well you didn't jump that stream. For if I'm not mistaken, I've heard tales of a brown man of these parts and he'd have torn you limb from limb. Whether he would have done or not, I don't know. But what I do know, is on their way home back to the pub indeed where they were spending the night a grouse flew up in front of them and the young man unable to control his finger on the trigger shot it and when that grouse thumped to the ground he felt a pain in his chest it was a pain that didn't go away and only got worse and it got so bad that one day he didn't wake up so a salutary tale from the Brune man who exists as far as I know only in Northumberland and indeed what was he? A god? A protector of the moor? An ancient person? I don't know. Certainly liminal. There one minute, gone the next. A bit like this song, this evocative song that we will hear now. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So the story that we're going to travel with between these songs today is the story of Tam Lin. Tam Lin is a, is a ballad, but it's also a tale. And any of you who've ever driven north past Otterburn, you'll go past in that borderland, the borderland where fairies love to dwell. You'll go past Carter Hoff. And the story happens at Carter Bar. And um, no, Carter Hall. And it's a story of Janet, who's the daughter of a wealthy laird who owns Carter Hall. And one morning, it's summertime. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, it's probably midsummer. Janet decided to go out into the forest. Her father's forest, actually, the, far, the forest her father had given her. And in her morning wildness, she tucked her green skirt above her knee and went past the lime tree, the oak, the ash, the alder, the birch, each with their leaves shaking in the wind, casting dancing patterns on the ground. She smiled to herself. She almost skipped. It was a lovely day. And she came to a pool. And, uh, and there was a mound at the back of the pool and uh, on the top of the mound was a hawthorn, you know, with those beautiful white blossoms, sometimes so dense and so intense, you can hardly believe it. And she sat underneath the hawthorn and she looked into the pool. And it was, as she was looking, she absentmindedly plucked a rose from a rose bush. It was a double-headed rose. It was quite unusual. And as she was holding it, she heard a voice. What right have you to pluck that rose, said the voice. And she looked into the pool and there was a reflection. And it was a reflection of the face of a young man, fair hair and blue eyes staring right at her. And Janet said, <laughs> what right have I? I own these woods, he said. You nor anyone else owns these woods. And with those words, she was sort of overcome by the aroma, the scent of the flowers of the hawthorn. It sent her into a kind of other kind of space. And then there was this pulse this pulse that seemed to come from the earth. And the next thing Janet knew was she was up and she was moving. She was swaying. She was dancing. She was dancing to the scent. She was dancing to the earth. She was dancing to the rhythm of the earth. And she wasn't alone for that young man she'd seen in the reflection. He was dancing too. And the rest of it is a bit of a hay. But they danced until twilight, until the moon rose into the sky. Under the full moonlight we dance, spirits dance, we dance, joining hands we dance, joining souls rejoice. Under the full moonlight we dance, Oh, sweet. 
Janet woke up on that grassy mound as the sun rose. She had the sense that somebody was lying beside her. She wasn't sure. She got up, but there was no one there. She looked in the pool and it was almost as if she could still see the reflection, the reflection of that fair-haired man, or was he disappearing deep down? She didn't know because the whole world had changed. As she walked back, she realised she didn't own the forest. The forest had claimed her, and she felt her belly, and it seemed like something else had been claimed. Too. She went back to Carter Hall, to where her father lived and all his servants and mighty entourage, and she entered back into that world, but her mind was never quite truly fully there. And of course, her belly began to swell. And one day it was coming to autumn time. Her father came to her and looked first in her face and then at her belly and then back into her eyes and said, which one of my knights is responsible for that, young Janet? And young Janet said, none of them, father, and I'm glad of it, for this is made by a fairy the father laughed. His daughter had always been a wild thing and he strode away, not sure what to do or to think about that. And it was almost as if that was the call she needed, for it was Halloween in those days, ancient days, Samhain, the old Celtic New Year, and she was called back to the forest she walked. This time those leaves that were fluttering and green were now yellow and brown and she kicked heaps of them as she walked through. Fruits were hanging down on the branches and when she got to that pool the hawthorn tree instead of flowers had red berries. She sat she looked at the pool, there was a breeze, there was ripples on the, on the surface. And she saw his face. She said, and I don't even know your name. And he said, my name is Tam Lin. And she said, and what are you doing here? And he said, I am held, I cannot leave. And she looked at him and said, you are held? Who or what holds you, Tan Lin? And he said, well, it's like this. One day, some time ago, I have no idea about when, I was riding through this wood. It was coming to dark and I felt this pull whether the pull was coming from inside or outside, I really don't know, but it was strong. And I came off my horse 
and I didn't fall on the ground, I fell into the ground and I went down and down and down and down and I was there in fairyland. It's different. There is no time in fairyland or not like ours. So I have no idea how long I've been there. It is not good nor bad. he said, and Janet noticed a little flicker of fear in his eyes. But what, she said, every 10 years, every seven years, actually, I must get my numbers right here. Every seven years, the queen of the fairies has to give a tithe to hell. And I believe this year that tithe will be me, for I'm fit and fair and strong. And the tithe will be given tonight at midnight, Halloween. And Janet looked at him and said, and what might a person do to help you, to free you from this tithe? And he looked and said, if there was one who loved me, they might wait just there. You see where the roads cross? Wait there at midnight. You will see coming at the stroke of midnight, one black horse and then a brown and then a white horse. And that will be mine. I will have one gloved hand and one bare, a cocked hat, and combed back hair. You must pull me from that horse. I will change from one thing to another, but you must not let go. And then you must throw whatever you have into the pool and you will see what happens next. When I sleep, the shadows of my softer than feathers and warm as creatures who have been close to the sun they say we are the givers and tell of oranges growing on trees they say we are the vessel and tell
was gone. Those were the last words she heard. And she waited until the sun went down and it was dark. And then she hid, hid where the roads crossed. She hid in a bush, a holly bush, and she made herself as small and as invisible as she possibly could. She shuddered, for it became cold. And then it was midnight. She heard the jingling of reins, the hooves of horses. And there it came in the moonlight, the shining black steed. And on it, the stiff body of the queen of the fairies, eyes wide and bright. Behind her, the brown horses with her entourage, and there at the back, the white steed with Tam Lin. With his one gloved hand and one bare, his cocked hat and combed back hair, he rode past her and she waited and waited, her heart thumping. And when he was level, she jumped, she grabbed him, and held him and pulled him to the ground the whole weight of him wrapped her arms around him but no sooner had she had him in her arms and he turned into a snake it wrapped its body around and squeezed but she held and then from snake to wolf with snarling fangs and digging claws and still she held and then from wolf to burning iron which she wrapped in her shawl and she ran to the pool and she threw it into the air as it spun into the air iron became coal glowing red coal which sizzled as it fell into the water and she waited the moonlight dancing on the surface of the water and then he appeared the fair hair, the blue eyes, naked, all fairy garments gone, all ties to the fairy land washed away. And she wrapped her shawl around him and was aware of a presence for there above was the fairy queen, mighty, strong, powerful fairy queen and she looked down at Tamlin and smiled and said ah if I had known you'd been cavorting with mortals Tamlin I'd have put wood in your eyes but it was too late and she rode away and as she rode away she held his hand and he stroked her belly full of his child and they walked into another world with hands open. When there is light in the soul, there is beauty in the person. When there is beauty
So we've heard the tales of the fairy folk. We've heard songs that evoke the fairy land, the fairy land. And where might you find them? For as I've said before, Northumberland is full of fairy folk. Well, the best guide would be to read my book, Folk Tales of Northumberland, because there you'll find many stories of the fairy folk. And the stories of the fairy folk are different from fairy tales. Fairy tales are not necessarily about fairies. They're steps, tales of wonder and imagination. The tales of fairies are slightly different, but you'll find them there. And most of the fairy stories in Northumberland are located in particular places with a particular fairy creature. If you went to Rothley Mill, not far from Morpeth, you'd find the old boulders, the old stones of an old mill house where the queen of the fairies encountered a miller. If you went up, to, up onto the moors above Elsdon, you'd find a place where a, a gentleman and his horse met the queen of the fairies. Down at Nether Witton, you'd find a place where a, a woman, a midwife, was taken away by the fairies and given the magic ointment. On Simon's Side Hill, you'll find the Durga. There are many of these fairy folk. Go there. Go to the places. Lie on the ground. Feel the earth. Maybe you could tell the place, the story, your story. Maybe you could sing it a song, your song. For I've always found that the best way to get a story is to tell one first. And the best way to hear a song is to sing one first. One song deserves another. Go and try it. The land is all for yours and for your listening. Good night, everybody, and thank you very much for being here. Um, yes, the any money that's raised from this evening, we're going to give to a charity called Peace of Mind, which helps people, um, asylum seekers in this country, who particularly during lockdown have had a very, very tough time even finding food to eat. They, they're definitely folk in transition in a liminal place in their own life. So they're well worth supporting. So I bid you farewell and may you walk well in the